you so much for inviting me. This is a, such a privilege and a great opportunity. Um, I uh, am going to speak today about some of the work that uh, we've been doing uh, towards per a personalized approach to psychotherapy and specifically how to think about integrating neurobiology and mechanisms of change in studying psychotherapy process and outcome. Um, so when um, Alex uh, and, the com and the ComCom committee invited me, they gave me sort of a blank check to talk about whatever I wanted. Um, and so I'm going to talk uh, about my personal journey as well, because one of the things I think uh, is sort of important to state is that I'm an, an early career person. I finished my PhD a year ago, um, and I'm currently at my postdoc. And so I'm going to present some work that uh, I've been doing over the last few years uh, on this topic and uh, sort of introduce that through my, uh, my personal academic journey. So um, six years ago, I arrived on this plane here, or a similar plane, um, from Israel. And I came to New York specifically to work with Jacques Barber um, it, because I really wanted to train in psychotherapy research and uh, pursue an academic career um, as a clinician researcher. Um, and I came to Adelphi University here. It's at the suburbs of New York. Um, it's a beautiful campus very serene and i got this incredible training there in um, psychotherapy outcome and process um, and then about 10 months ago i transitioned to a postdoc at wall cornell medical college uh, we have two campuses and two groups that i'm working with um, it's uh one is uh in the suburbs of new york but um not at the same place uh, it's a hogwarts like campus um, at Westchester, and that's where I'm working with the group on psychotherapy processes and specifically thinking about um, uh, mechanisms of change in psychotherapy. And I also work with um, a group of neuroscientists uh, here in the Upper East Side. Um, and it's a, this amazing interdisciplinary team that is thinking about um, how to integrate neurobiology into uh, treatment decisions and specifically uh, more recently uh, working on biotyping and thinking about how specific patient profiles can uh, relate to uh, selection of treatments. And I'm going to present some early work that I've been doing uh, and really uh, beginning to become uh, uh, familiar with the field of neuroimaging and, and neurobiology. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to uh, start. Um, and before I uh, delve into uh, data and science, I'm going to say a couple of words about funding. I've been really fortunate to be funded by the uh, National Institute of Mental Health. My fellowship is 100% funded by NIMH, um, and my work is largely funded by um, the Wild Cornell Alacrity Center grant that George Alexopoulos, my PI, is um, uh, responsible for. Um, all of the work I'm going to present today came from randomized controlled trials that uh, were conducted uh, with the support of NIMH. Um, and I also have some additional grants. Uh, recently received an SBR small collaborative grant with Christoph Kultengear that's going to support um, the neurobiology, uh, some of the neurobiological aspects of integration that I'm going to present, uh, the APF Next Generation Fund, and the George Stryker Fellowship. OK, so um, thinking about uh, uh, taking this personalized approach to psychotherapy, uh, my work has focused has been focusing on what treatment ingredients predict change. Um, and I'm, this is an agenda slide. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, which we like doing in academia, um, and sort of uh, present a framework. So I'm going to show some work we've done on techniques and alliance as predictors of improvement and mechanisms of change, specifically in panic disorder treatments. Um, then I'm going to present uh, some uh, uh, a study on interpersonal and social rewards as candidate mechanisms of change in late life depression treatment, predictors of early risk to non-response in psychotherapy using machine learning uh, models, um, neural activation and reward in affect networks as predictor of change, and finally an integration of all of this into a framework that we're working on and in integrating. Um, the constructs of alliance and the working alliance and uh, these neurobiological constructs of reward. Um, and I'm going to present some future work we're going to um, we're, we're working on. So um, targeting mechanisms of change in psychotherapy. Mechanisms of change is uh, 
one of these terms that people mean different things when they uh, say them, and there's a conceptual and the statistical aspects of, of the construct. I'm going to present the way that we've been thinking about um, this term, and of course there's many other alternative ways to think about it. Um, so we've been using, um, or I've been really uh, found the NIMH um, framework helpful. Uh, they defined a mechanism of change as the underlying psychological, social, and neurophysiological process through which therapeutic change occurs. Um, and it can be within an individual patient, so it could be a capacity or an ability that we help the patient develop over the course of treatment that facilitates uh, uh, reduction in symptoms or other primary outcomes. It can be external factors. Um, it can be a neural system, a cognitive process, a psychosocial behavior, or, or something that the therapist is doing. And I think this is the core aspect, uh, specifically from an AMH perspective, but also from a personalization perspective moving forward, um, is that in order to show that something is a mechanism, we need to prospectively modify or experimentally change that mechanism in treatment and then show a causal relationship. So after the mechanism changes, the symptoms improve. Um, uh, and, and that's an important aspect of, of mechanisms of change studies uh, from our perspective. Okay, so uh, we've been working on this framework on of matching patients' interventions and mechanisms and thinking about how we can move towards personalization in that way. Um, and there's been really very exciting and uh, incredible work done in the past few years specifically uh, by the Derubius lab and others uh, identifying what treatment packages benefit which, treat, which patients. Um, there's been increase in uh, the importance of looking at within patient fluctuations over time in the therapeutic change. So really thinking about an individualized approach to studying process um, and how individuals specifically change over time and maybe the way that they change over time can help us understand um, what mechanisms uh, to target. Um, and so identifying which interventions are most beneficial within treatment packages is important. It has significant clinical implications. If we know what techniques or interventions are most helpful within these treatment packages, we can implement and focus on those techniques, not only in a RCT um, setting, but also uh, in the community. Um, and thinking about uh, what mechanisms these interventions are targeting. And so if we have an intervention that is very useful, um, what uh, mechanism is that intervention targeting? Um, and then uh, um, um, moving forward, could specific patients benefit from targeting specific mechanisms? Um, and, and, and if so, then those mechanisms would be worth worth targeting uh, within a treatment. Um, so uh, Jacques Barber, who was my PhD advisor, and I uh, wrote this piece for uh, World Psychiatry. It's going to come out. And we've outlined some of our thoughts about um, these topics and how we can move forward. So the first study that uh, we conducted in that I'm going to present today is really sort of flipping the uh, focus and thinking about mechanisms of change as an outcome in and of themselves, and thinking about this idea that usually in psychotherapy research, uh, we focus on symptoms as the primary outcome, as the gold standard. And if we're thinking that these mechanisms of change or these candidate mechanisms of change are really important, then it might be worthwhile to focus on these mechanisms as an outcome in and of themselves, and then ask then which techniques and interventions predict these change in these mechanisms and whether the therapeutic alliance that has been considered one of the core vehicles of change in psychotherapy predicts change in these mechanisms. So we asked those questions within uh, a randomized controlled trial, the Penn Cornell controlled trial, um, comparing 12 weeks of either CBT or panic focused psychodynamic therapy that was developed by Fred Bush, Barbara Millard, um, et al. Um, and the primary outcomes have been published that uh, both treatments were uh, effective in reducing panic with uh, some side differences that I'm not going to get into today. Um, so we focused on two mechanisms that were defined a priori uh, it, within the, the initial grant. And we the, the randomized control trial was designed to look at those mechanisms. Um, from a psychodynamic perspective, we looked at panic-specific mentalization. It's the patient's ability to reflect on the psychological underpinning and the emotional meaning of symptoms. So thinking about why are you ha having a panic attack, a low mentalization 
uh, would be because of the heat. And a high mentalization might be because, well, I have them every time I have an argument with my spouse. And I think it's because I'm afraid that if I get angry, my spouse would leave me. And so then I experience this panic instead. And so there's this understanding of this deeper sort of underlining conflict that the patient then becomes aware of that triggers panic. Um, and we, in research, we call this panic-specific reflective function. I'm going to use mentalization, which is a theoretical construct just for consistency and because um, uh, it's shorter and easier. Um, and then from a CBT perspective, we had um, misinterpretation of bodily sensation as a core mechanism or candidate mechanism. It's the tendency to misinterpret natural, natural bodily sensations as catastrophic. So panic patients um, have this tendency to experience um, natural changes in their bodily sensations and then um, um, misinterpret those as dangerous. Um, and so if the train is coming and uh, I'm having a, uh, heart palpitations because um, of this change in environment, I might think, oh, my heart palpitations are indicating that I'm having a panic, I'm having a heart attack, and then would rush to the ER and get all these checks and, 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 and end up in this vicious cycle of fearing uh, natural changes in bodily sensations and misinterpreting them. So the thinking is that if we change, if we improve patients' capacity um, in each of these mechanisms, um, panic would be reduced. And we've showed that in a, in a paper that's in the pipeline and we also recently published a paper that shows that when patients come in with these, uh, with a higher panic-specific mentalization, uh, they improve more on in interpersonal outcomes. In our case, it was quality of object relations. So what was important here for us is to look at these mechanisms, not only within the treatment that they were developed in, but also in the, in the, in the other treatment, in the other arm. Um, and, and thinking about this idea that if we want to understand how mechanisms operate, we need to look at them broadly across uh, uh, treatment packages. Um, so we asked, uh, we published this earlier this year in psychotherapy research, we asked two questions. Um, does a strong working alliance predict improvement in a mechanism? And does use of specific techniques predict improvement in mechanisms? So we use this uh, um, statistical approach, um, random intercept cross lag panel modeling that we find very helpful and we've been using since in, in various studies that we have ongoing. Um, it was developed by Ellen Hamacker and then really put forth uh, into psychotherapy by Frederick Polkenstorm, my collaborator. I mean, it allows to control for prior change and really focus on this within patient fluctuations throughout treatment, disentangling the between level variability. So, uh, Sigazi Hamano has been uh, uh, putting forth this idea of state versus trade that I find very helpful. So to think about how our patients change on a state level over time, over the course of treatment, um, and in order to guide timing of intervention and think about when change occurs and how can we facilitate that change uh, to occur. And then when you think about constructs like the alliance, it's really important to control for symptomatic change when you're looking at alliance predicting mechanisms because there's this well-documented association between alliance and symptoms. So this is how the model looks. Essentially, we uh, create this random intercept for the between level um, and we focus and then we have these latent variables for the within level. These are essentially mean-centered variables that look at patients' deviations from their own mean over time. And what we were interested in is the associations between the alliance and the mechanisms. I'm not showing the, I, I, I'm showing the alliance model here, not the technique model that was actually uh, simpler. Um, so we look at these, these lags um, that are bolded here, and I'm gonna show you the results and it's gonna hopefully come to life. Okay, so what did we find? So, um, we looked at alliance in both treatments, CBT and psychodynamic therapy, um, and misinterpretation and mentalization are two candidate mechanisms. Um, and then when we looked at alliance at week three and mechanisms subsequently at week five, um, we found no change in misinterpretation whatsoever. Um, in terms of mentalization, there was no change early on, but then when we look at alliance at week five predicting subsequent change in the mechanisms in week 12, uh, we found some interesting findings. So in CBT, when patients uh, had higher alliance with their therapist, their mentalization increased, um, but the opposite, sorry, decreased, but the opposite was true for psychodynamic therapy. If you had higher alliance, mentalization increased. So um, 
I think this is really interesting because it kind of shows us that a mechanism can operate in different ways depending on the framework of the treatment that the patient is being given. And we can, one of the ways that, there's many explanations, we've had discussions with people about this finding. Um, one of the ways that we've been explaining it is um, that when you think about the components of alliance, here it was measured by the WAI, I'm sorry, I didn't say the misinterpretation was a self-report and mentalization was coded from structured interviews by reliable and trained coders. So when we think about alliance, it's structured from bond, goals, and tasks. So if a patient has a strong alliance with their therapist, that means that they don't they not only have an, a strong emotional bond with the therapist, they also have sort of this buy-in. They agree on the frame and the meaning system that the patient, that the therapist is providing them. So if a patient is receiving CBT and develops a strong alliance with their therapist, they might not think or work on this idea of these underlining interpersonal conflicts that are associated with panic symptoms. They might change on other mechanisms that we didn't look at here, but um, um, they may not necessarily change on this mechanism that the therapist is not focusing on. And where the opposite may be true for psychodynamic therapy, where um, the therapist is really instructed to facilitate this understanding of these underlining conflicts, and then um, patients who are higher on alliance may then show increase so that they'll be sort of good learners of the framework or they'll be really on board with the tasks and the goals of the therapy and then show increase in this uh, mechanism. So then for the second question, does use of specific therapeutic techniques predict improvement in the mechanism? Um, and in, in order to study techniques, we use the multi theoretical list of interventions, which is a measure that was developed by McCarthy and Barber in 2009. Um, it's a measure of either 60 or 30 items on eight subscales that represent the major therapeutic approaches, psychodynamic, cross-experiential, interpersonal, person-centered, cognitive behavioral, DBT, and common factors. Um, and each item in the multi uh, represents an intervention. So for example, the therapist set an agenda or established specific goals for the therapy session. So we have, in our case, we have observers, uh, uh, watch the videotape session, and then at the end of the session, they need to code each of these items from uh, one to five, one being not typical at all to the session, five being very typical. Um, we used observers in this study, but it can com be completed by patients and therapists, and people have done that successfully and reliably. Um, and it can be used to compare techniques used by different therapists or identify associations between techniques and outcomes, the therapeutic alliance, or other mechanisms like cephal understanding or insight. Um, and uh, we recently developed a short version that's available and has been adopted by uh, many labs uh, across the world. And um, we've seen some of that data and we have some of that data in the pipeline. Um, the Fisher paper here is using the uh, 30 item and um, it's been uh, going well. Um, and so for this study, we collected uh, 830 multi-codings from trained and reliable observers that we trained um, and um, averaged out those uh, reliable codings uh, to construct the items. And what I want to say before I show you the results is that what's important to uh, 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 understand about the multi is that it's a descriptive measure that really helps us um, describe what are the, the actions that the therapist is taking within a therapy frame. And so it's not an adherence or a competence measure. We're not me measuring whether therapists are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're just coding what we're seeing, what they're what what their act what what are the actions that they're taking um, in the session? Um, so first, we looked at misinterpretations and we asked which techniques predict subsequent improvement in misinterpretations. We had no findings for the psychodynamic therapy, which we were not very surprised about because we didn't expect misinterpretation to play a significant role um, in psychodynamic therapy. But in CBT, uh, we had some interesting findings. So in week one, when the therapist uh, focused on thoughts and cognitions, so uh, providing a lot of psychoeducation, a lot of uh, focus on uh, the patient's sort of cognitive frame, um, then the patient actually showed increase in misinterpretations. Whereas when the therapist focused on moment-to-moment uh, -moment experience and the patient's affect, then the patient showed reduction in misinterpretations. 
So how do we understand this? Um, this was not initially an intuitive finding for us. And one of the things that we do when we, after we analyze the data and everything's said and done, and we check that our models are well fitted and everything checks out, then we go back to the tapes and we look at those sessions that have high codings on those subscales that we found data, that we found findings for, and we try to understand the qualitative uh, uh, aspect of, the, of these findings. And so what we saw here is that when therapists were focusing, were providing extensive psychoeducation, or were focusing a lot on this more aspect of the therapy early on, patients sometimes became overwhelmed, um, and then may have then contributed to their uh, development of um, to the to, to sort of this increase in the mechanism. Um, it's also possible one of the the explanations that we've raised in our group is that it's possible that patients actually benefited and then we're better able to report their misinterpretations later on. And so we have these two sort of explanations. As for the second finding, um, when therapists did this moment-to-moment -moment experience and affect, many times qualitatively, that meant that when the patient experienced a bodily sensation in the, in the, in, within the session, the therapist addressed that right away rather than sticking with um, the protocol and kind of going through what the agenda was. Um, and there's um, um, a structured agenda for these early sessions. Um, and so um, this um, sort of attunement or this focus on the patient's experience within the moment in the session, asking how are you feeling or did you feel, I, I noticed a change or your, 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 your breath seemed heavier, then um, um, uh, contributed to, or was associated with um, uh, less misinterpretation later on. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to mentalization or panic-focused mentalization. So here, interestingly, we had the same pattern of findings in both treatments, uh, which we didn't necessarily expect. So in week one, in both treatments, when therapists focused on interpersonal relationships, it, looks ve it looked very differently in CBT and in psychodynamic therapy. Of course, it was within the frame of an adherent um, treatment package. Uh, then at week five, patients uh, improved on mentalization. Whereas uh, when therapists focused on thoughts and behaviors, patients, mis uh, uh, patients uh, uh, showed a reduction in mentalization. So here, um, there, I found this very interesting when we're thinking about uh, targeting mechanisms and what should we do to target mechanisms and moving forward and then thinking later about um, um, uh, who's gonna benefit from these mechanisms and how those mechanisms can play a role in um, selecting specific interventions. Um, um, here we see that the interpersonal focus, whereas if it's in CBT, it usually looked like um, triggers of panic that are associated with perhaps a conflict with another person or uh, thoughts about uh, what another person is going to think of me or being in a social environment and anxiety regarding the social environment with either significant others or friends, or if it was in a psychodynamic uh, frame where it was more of the underlying conflict. Um, um, uh, and, and, and perhaps uh, unconscious aspects of the person's interpersonal functioning, patient's mentalization increased. Um, and then if you focus more on thoughts and behaviors, again, there's this, um, we have this hypothesis of this sort of competition between mechanisms that you know, we don't have data for, but perhaps is happening is that you can sort of have it all. You can't have the, the whole cake. So if you're focusing on one aspect, the mechanism might change, whereas if you're focusing on thoughts and behaviors, there might be other aspects of the therapy that then uh, 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 improve that we that did not measure in this study. So I, uh, uh, oh, and an important point is that this happened early on as well as later on. So it was um, the, the, the most robust finding we had from this study because it was true for both treatments and it was true for both the early and the late lags. So I got very interested in this idea of uh, interpersonal focus and specifically thinking about this interpersonal focus in a cognitive behavioral therapy um, uh, being perhaps beneficial. And so, um, uh, as I said, about 10 months ago, I transitioned to postdoc and I was really looking for um, an academic group um, that uh, conducts clinical research in both uh, the lab and uh, outside in the community and thinks about this uh, relationship between uh, developing treatments, thinking about personalization of treatments and then implementing them in the community. Um, and um, I joined uh, the Wild Cornell group 
Um, and at Westchester, that's the um, uh, Institute of Geriatric Psychiatry, and we focus on older adults um, specifically. Um, and, and what uh, mechanisms of change uh, facilitate improvement in late life depression? Um, so <clears throat> why older adults? First of all, much less is known about process uh, and outcome in older adults. The vast majority of the knowledge that we have in psychotherapy research is on adult populations. Um, uh, older adults have lower response rates to pharmacological treatments and interactions with medical conditions. And so a lot of times, psychotherapy is the first line of treatment. Um, there's this phenomenon that's called a silver tsunami. There's a growing population of older adults, not only in the US, uh, but also around the world, uh, that has increasing public health so, uh, cost. And so there's this pressing need and, 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 and call um, to develop effective interventions that are going to um, be able to streamline the mental health services that are being provided for this growing population that requires services. Um, and then on, on, from, a, from a sort of content personal perspective, loneliness and social isolations are robust predictors of negative health outcomes. And so thinking about my interest in social and interpersonal aspects of psychotherapy, um, older adults are a, a good specialized target population to study these constructs because Wait, all you need to do to be lonely and socially isolated is grow old, essentially. Um, and people around you start passing away and you lose your social networks and there's this growing need to be connected with others. Um, and this need is often uh, uh, addressed in psychotherapy because we see those patients that suffer from that the most. So I started to think about this idea of social reward as a mechanism of change in psychotherapy for late life depression. And this is also part of the steps and the conversations that I've been taking as uh, since joining uh, the group here in thinking about um, uh, change uh, or mechanisms of change in psychotherapy from a neurobiological perspective uh, uh, that's being used um, uh, to sort of integrate brain and behavior. So as I said, loneliness and social isolation are uh, associated with various negative mental health and medical problems, including depression. Um, and Neurobiological studies show that reward processing is often impaired in depression. So regions that are responsible for processing rewards, rewarding um, 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 experiences, show impairment and abnormalities. Uh, we also see that decreased reward responsiveness is associated with more depression. So if the, the less responsive you are to, um, uh, on, a, on, a neurobi on a neural level, um, the more depressed you are. Um, and there is some recent evidence showing that neural systems involved in monitoring social reward may overlap. And so usually the traditional way or the conventional way of studying rewards in neurobiological research is paradigms where patients receive money, um, um, small amounts of money, and we measure the activation, <clears throat> the neural activation while uh, before for the anticipation and while uh, receiving the reward. Um, and some recent work has focused on this idea that social reward, which, which in this case uh, is operationalized as feedback from another person, um, um, may light up um, simply putting um, similar regions in the brain. And specifically, there is some uh, exciting work showing that older adults may be more responsive to social rewards, which is really in line with sort of the clinical understanding. If you have older adults in your life or you're treating older adults, you can think about what's really important to them. And a lot of times that's not um, having a little bit more money, but rather um, feeling heard, being connected, being respected, um, um, having their um, significant others visit and care about them. And so um, it seems like this might be an important target. So <clears throat> we asked uh, this question, so do socially rewarding activities predict change um, in a step uh, psychotherapy or stepwise psychotherapy for late life depression. So based on this premise that social reward may predict change, then the next step would be, well, then if patients engage in these social rewarding activities as part of their psychotherapy, is that a treatment component that then facilitates change? Um, so taking this theory and, and, and understanding how that plays a role in, in, in treatment components in psychotherapy. Um, we published this early, earlier this year, um, and this <clears throat> data came from um, an open trial that, we can, that was conducted here with uh, 48 depressed older adults receiving nine weeks of engaged behavioral activation therapy. 
Engage is a, um, a sort of personalized step psychotherapy that was developed by George Alexopoulos, my mentor, and Patricia Arian from University of Washington, then at UCSF. Um, and the primary intervention is reward exposure. So really getting uh, patients to either do more of what they are not doing enough of or doing things that they are not doing. So engaging in these rewarding and pleasurable activities, thinking that those that repeated engagement in rewarding and pleasurable activities uh, will then uh, increase reward processing in these regions in the brain that are impaired uh, and facilitate more behavioral activation and less depression. And I'm not going to go uh, very much into the, the model of the therapy, but it's uh, a stepped therapy. So after week three, if patients don't respond, there's a procedure of identifying the specific barrier that gets in the way of the patient engaging in a rewarding activity. And then there's techniques that are being utilized to address that barrier. Um, so uh, before I go into this, I want to say that we uh, use mixed effects models and we've shown that uh, behavioral activation increases and depression decreases. And then we asked, okay, but what facilitates change in the mechanism? What, what treatment component? In this case, what activities? So patients at each week of the nine weeks select one activity, they're going to engage in more over the next week, um, and that's being selected through this mutual discussion with the therapist. The therapist doesn't push the patient to decide what activity to choose, so, uh, but, 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 but there is a, sort of a discussion about what would be most useful. So we took all of these activities for each patient that was selected, and we uh, categorized them into three categories. Solitary, so reading or, 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 or gardening, things you do by yourself. Uh, social group, so attending church or going to a class, um, and interpersonal. That was um, an interaction with a significant, with a significant other. So um, either um, going to the movies with my grandchild or uh, visiting a friend. Um, so something you're doing with a with a significant other that is being identified. And then we asked, um, did higher percentage of these activities uh, uh, within patient uh, then facilitated greater behavioral activation and reduction in depression? So for solitary activities, there was no change. Uh, not on this mechanism, the, the candidate mechanism, the behavioral activation, and not on depression. For social group activities, we actually uh, did not expect this, but we found that there was a decrease in behavioral activation and no change in depression. Whereas for the interpersonal activities, if you had more of these, you increased in behavioral activation, so you were more likely to do more, <clears throat> and your depression subsequently re was reduced. So um, the, this last finding was really kind of providing us with a signal um, that this might be an important target in psychotherapy, and I want to say <clears throat> a couple of words about how we've been understanding this. Um, um, so. It's possible that when older adults go to, for example, a senior center or a class or church, they may sit there, but they may, um, given their depression and given their social isolation, they may not engage with other people. And so this might become this uh, uh, discouraging um, experience where you're sort of sitting there and no one's talking to you and you might not get more depressed. You might still benefit from, from doing something, but you might be less likely to do that again. And that may explain this reduction in behavioral activation subsequently. Um, and, and, and another aspect that actually um, in discussion about these findings with Kevin McCarthy the other day, he, he suggested is that um, when we think about these group situations, not only for older adults, but especially for older adults, um, they tend to be very passive. So you're just participating, you're a, you're a passive participant. That doesn't facilitate engagement in, on this one-to-one um, um, interaction that may uh, make you feel better and make you feel more heard, more understood, more listened to. Um, so we looked at this signal and we said, okay, so we see that patients who receive the psychotherapy for late life depression improve more if they engage in these interpersonal um, activities. And so then we wanted to understand, well, what is going on with the non-responders? Um, and how can we uh, understand more why patients don't respond and, and detect that earlier on um, in thinking about uh, developing further these uh, stepped or personalized psychotherapy models. Um, <clears throat> so um, we conducted this study looking at uh, early risk for treatment non-response using machine learning models. Um, um, and um, this was based on this robust finding in adult psychotherapy and also in older adults 
uh, that over 50% of patients receiving psychotherapy don't respond to treatment. Um, these non-responders are the patients that suffer the most from ongoing and debilitating psychological conditions. Um, they're the most expensive, expensive patients. They're the patients that uh, uh, suffer the longest. They have negative uh, um, um, uh, long-term outcomes. Um, and they provide a significant uh, and pressing need to really address uh, 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 that mental health uh, with burden with um, effective treatments. And then from a sort of um, methodological perspective, the way we usually do things, especially from an RCT perspective, is that we detect patients on a group level, uh, non-responders on a group level at the end of treatment. So we complete the RCT and then we say, okay, 58% did not respond. And then we we identify predictors of response and we focus on the patients who did respond and then we move on to the next funding mechanism and and and, and those non-responders essentially sort of are being left um, within the system to find other um, services um, and and a lot of times requiring multiple rounds of treatment so um, thinking about this um, we, we we really wanted to um, 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 begin to understand how we can detect risks of non-response early on. And if we can detect predictors of non-response, so patients who tend not to respond um, in general and to specific treatment packages, then that could potentially inform interventions focusing on addressing those reasons for non-response. So the objectives of this study was to identify which patients are at risk of early non-response, um, what predicts being an early non-responder, and, and potentially then translate those predictors to mechanisms of change that could be targeted within a treatment to increase response rates. So the study was a randomized controlled trial where 218 depressed older adults with executive dys dysfunction received either problem-solving therapy or supportive psychotherapy. Problem-solving therapy is a cognitive behavioral, more behavioral therapy that focuses on facilitating problem-solving skills. Um, so there's, a, a, there's the, um, a teaching of the skills and then there's practice to help patients uh, 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 develop more adaptive ways to cope with problems. And it's been shown to be effective for um, uh, late life depression as well as late life depression with executive dysfunction. Uh, the primary results have been published uh, elsewhere. And uh, what um, we found was that uh, both treatments were effective in reducing depression and disability, which was a primary outcome or secondary outcome for the executive dysfunction um, profile. Um, but problem-solving therapy was uh, uh, superior in week uh, nine and 12. So later on in treatment, uh, the treatment separated. And so we, de we defined early non-response or early response trajectory as the depression severity slope um, in weeks uh, baseline to week six. And the reason for selecting that time lag um, is twofold. There's a theoretical reason. Uh, most early response uh, paper studies have focused on uh, zero to four or five or six. Um, and there's also a statistical reason is that we really, uh, all the models that, I, we, that I'm gonna show you, we conducted with zero to four, zero to five, zero to six, and that zero to six uh, models were most well fitted and more parsimonious, and so um, we 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 went with the data as well as 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 as, as um, basing it on uh, previous work that has been done in this area. So in order to detect early responders, non-responders, we use a latent growth mixture model um, based on this idea that we should be really looking at slopes uh, of individual patients over time and thinking about uh, not only. Um, classifying patients as responders or not responders based on this one time point at the end of treatment and defined uh, as 50% reduction or um, HAMD or specific HAMD score, but rather the way that they change over time. Um, and this is uh, what we found that two class model was most well fitted. We tried uh, uh, two class two, from two to seven classes, and this was uh, uh, the most well fitted one. And we had uh, 22% of early non, this is uh, zero to six weeks. We had 22% of early non-responders and then the rest were responders. Um, and if you, uh, if, and, and the, w when you look at the figure for the 12 weeks, you really can see uh, a continuation of this pattern. So you have this stable slope that sort of plateaus um, and doesn't really change over time. And then uh, the responders keep uh, improving. 
Um, and then uh, uh, we, uh, we looked at whether these classifications actually predict outcome at the end of treatment um, to, to, to sort of um, check our hypothesis that these early trajectories are important. Um, and classification predicted uh, depression severity, response status, and remission status at the end of treatment. There were no treatment differences in classification, so there was almost identical number of early non-responders in each of the treatment classes, um, uh, um, which, which sort of says something about uh, this early non-specific response trajectory to cyclotherapy. Um, classification, our classification here using these models um, was a stronger predictor of outcome compared to baseline uh, depression severity in terms of the uh, uh, area under the curve or the uh, amount of explained variance. Um, and, uh, and importantly, 100% of these early non-responders were non-responders and non-remitters at the end of treatment. And so statistically speaking, if you were a non-responder um, um, here, if you were part of this orange group early on, there was no likelihood for you to then become a responder later on. So this is really showing us that we should really do something here um, when we're thinking about uh, developing treatment or, or modifying treatment modalities and, and, and em embedding decision points within treatment modalities um, um, to address non-response. So then um, we were able to identify these non-responders, but the question is then, uh, so what? If a patient, then if a patient comes into my office, how do I know that they're going to become an early non-responder or not? What information do I need to identify or to predict whether the patient is going to be a non-responder? And one of the, I think, the issues that we have in, in, in psychotherapy research, or at least things that we've been uh, struggling and working with, is that when you conduct a randomized controlled trial, you put like in a, a huge amount of measures because you want to look at different uh, aspects of, of, of functioning and you don't really know which one is going to be most important. Um, and from a clinical perspective, if you're if you're in the community or or if you're seeing patients in, in a clinical setting, you want to know what information is most important for you to get, uh, for you to know if this patient is going to respond or not. And so that was the the second goal of this uh, of this um, project. And machine learning models are ideal for this purpose because you you come in with this very exploratory approach. You say I have all this information. I want to retrospectively identify what information is most useful. And it's these models are, of course, being used by uh, uh, many of the uh, studies that are focusing on personalization of psychotherapy. So we had uh, various predictors um, that we used. Uh, we had treatment, we had demographic depression severity, various cognition uh, and disability measures, patient characteristics and treatment characteristics. And we really wanted to focus on these various domains of functioning and understand what domain of functioning and what measure is going to be most useful in predicting non-response. So we started with a classification tree, which is a flowchart type uh, model that helps you identify which predictor um, uh, 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 is most uh, important in classifying patients to the two classes. Um, and this is how it looks like. Um, and we used a full sample. So this is for visualization and clinical demonstration purposes. There was no bootstrapping for the clinical tree. I'm going to show that in a minute. We divided our sample to 75 training and 25 testing, and we pruned it using a com cost complexity index selected in a cross validation study, which basically means that we cut the branches of the bottom of the tree to make sure that we're not overfitting the tree and that it doesn't become very idiosyncratic so that one of so that uh, our, 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 our nodes are explaining one or two patients. Um, so what we found was that the most important predictors predictor of non-response was low subjective social support. So the orange are the responders and the blue are the non-responders. So it wasn't, we, we also measured actual support, so how much support you actually are getting, but that didn't come up. What came up was how much support you feel like you're getting. So your perception of, or your experience of how supported you are by others. The second was uh, uh, self-care. Um, um, so low self-care was associated with uh, uh, a more um, uh, likelihood to be a non-responder, and then low, and then high neuroticism. Um, um, so, in combination, if you had, uh, if you um, reported low subjective su social support, um, and you had poor self-care, and you were neurotic, you were most likely to be part of these uh, non-response classes. Um, and really, what this is showing us is this second uh, support for 
um, this idea that the social reward aspect or your experience of how um, much of this positive or good social interactions you're getting with other people makes a difference in the way that you use and respond to psychotherapy. Uh, we then repeated those analysis in a random forest tree, um, and this time bootstrapping, so essentially taking that tree and, uh, uh, and, and, and making 500 of, the, of those trees uh, uh, through this randomly selected subsample uh, uh, from the full data set um, that's called bagging, and we had a 75 training set and a 25 testing set again, and we aggregated those trees to produce variable importance uh, index that's called Gini impurity that's usually used with these models. We had good prediction accuracy, it was 80%. Um, and what you see here is uh, the, the variables or the predictors and the uh, order of importance. And what we were really happy to see, and if you use these models, you, you know that, that it's very satisfying when they uh, converge and show similar results, is that subjective support was the uh, highest predictor, followed by neuroticism that came out from the classification tree, followed by treatment expectancy, so how much you expect the treatment to help you, followed by age, so if you were older, you were le more likely to be a non-responder, and followed the, by these two social predictors, so your participation in society and your ability to get along with others. And then this is from the this alliance measure that we used here that was not the WAR, AI was the more extensive uh, measure uh, 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 that has negative, out, negative items as well as positive items, meaning um, uh, uh, negative items about your therapist, negative perceptions of the therapist. Um, and and your, perceiving your therapist as accepting was um, um, also pretty high up there. Um, and so you see that we have this nice cluster here that of really, except for the age, psychological variables of, and, and mostly, um, you know, this, this um, personality trait, but this, this ability to engage with other people, as well as the experience of how uh, uh, rewarding um, um, your interactions with others are. So um, this um, uh, uh, um, supported our, our, our trajectory of thinking about uh, social reward or socially rewarding experiences as a potential target. And then um, in collaboration with the group of neuroscientists um, at, um, at our um, uh, Neurobiology Institute um, in the city, um, we started to think about how we can look at the brain and, and look at these constructs um, and what um, um, changes uh, uh, from a neural perspective within psychotherapy. So we conducted this study uh, looking at resting state functional connectivity and affect and reward systems um, as predictor of change over the course of psychotherapy. And this uh, uh, data came from uh, a large randomized controlled trial um, that is ongoing, that uh, uh, is comparing between engaged, that is this novel, stepped, personalized type of behavioral activation therapy with problem-solving therapy, that's a gold standard um, uh, a therapy. And one of, the, um, um, one of the goals of this randomized controlled trial is to show that engage, that, which can be um, very easily taught and very easily trained on, um, and is, uh, 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 is structured in this way that's based on neurobiological studies, uh, maybe not inferior uh, to problem-solving therapy that is a more complex treatment. So patients received nine weeks of either treatment, and out of the large sample, we had 32 patients that agreed to be scanned um, in weeks at baseline in week six, um, and we looked at rest and state functional connectivity in four a priori regions of interest, the subgeneral uh, interior cingulate cortex, the um, uh, nucleus accumbens, the dorsal ACC, and the dorsal striatum. Um, and we have a few findings from this uh, project, but I'm going to show you two that are relevant for today's talk. Um, so in the combined sample in both engage and problem-solving therapy, with no treatment differences, we found that when functional connectivity was higher at baseline between the subgeneral SQC, which is this region that is understood as a core depression region or a negative affect region, and a middle temporal gyrus, which is part of the default mode network, so it's responsible uh, or, or associated with functions of self-referential thoughts or, 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 or sort of um, introspective processes uh, was associated with reduction in depression. And, um, uh, and so what's interesting about this and, and the way we've kind of been talking about it within our group is to think about um, uh, whether um, these treatments are helping 
uh, patients with this type of neuro uh, a, a, of neural profile. So patients who come in with this hyperconnectivity between these two regions, the negative affect and the default mode network, uh, may be benefited more from depression severity. And I want to highlight uh, a paper from uh, Downlope and the uh, Helen Meiper group uh, that was published in American Journal of Psychiatry that found a very similar finding to, to our finding uh, with similar connectivity between networks and show that patients uh, who, and showed a similar finding for patients receiving CBT, whereas patients who uh, was, were receiving medication showed the opposite finding. So a lower functional connectivity between these regions were associated with uh, greater response to medication. And so one of the things that we're continuing to think about is, can we identify these um, uh, 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 um, neural patterns or neural profiles um, that are associated with greater response to one treatment versus the other? We also had a nice uh, treatment-specific uh, finding, um, um, and we, we, sh we found that an increase from baseline to week six in functional connectivity between this core reward region, the nucleus accumbens, and this higher order superior parietal cortex that's uh, associated with executive attention or more attentional uh, functions was associated with uh, subsequent improvement in behavioral activation. So um, if patients showed improvement between this seed region of reward that is, um, 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 that is um, targeted in this behavioral activation therapy, um, and this higher order, uh, more cognitive region, then uh, they showed subsequent improvement in the mechanism, uh, the candidate mechanism of behavioral activation. So these are uh, uh, taken together. This is, is kind of a, another step forward towards understanding if we're looking at reward and affect systems and we're thinking about how that operates uh, from a behavioral and from a, from a treatment perspective, we, should, we can also integrate um, um, findings from um, uh, fMRI studies and, 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 and measure how that changes within the brain and how these associate, associations change over the course of treatment. So the next step uh, for me as a psychotherapy researcher trained at Adelphi with Jacques Barber is to take all this great training that I got uh, on the working alliance and, and, and core constructs and psychotherapy process and integrate them with this more neurobiological neuroimaging perspective and think about whether we can um, conceptualize the working alliance as a social reward. So we started to develop, uh, we, ha we, we, we developed a neurobiological social reward paradigm uh, uh, as, as part of this idea that we can perhaps measure objectively how uh, the therapeutic alliance uh, uh, um, affects or operates on a neural level. Um, so the premise was that if interpersonally rewarding activities uh, predict less depression and increase in behavioral activation, then perhaps uh, when the therapeutic interaction can be considered a social reward, um, and so when you think about uh, a good sort of uh, uh, successful treatment, it has this social rewarding experience of the interaction between the therapist and the patient. And this is especially uh, meaningful for older adults who oftentimes I know that from, from, from just working clinic, I also work clinically here as a study therapist on one of the randomized controlled trials and treating patients who are receiving uh, these treatments is that a lot of times the therapist is the only person that they see over the course of the week. And so it becomes, you become it. It becomes this very important uh, experience, uh, uh, interpersonal experience. So um, a successful or beneficial therapeutic interaction uh, of social reward may also be reflected by higher reports, self-reports on uh, the strength of the therapeutic alliance. And then the question is, can we then integrate neurobiology and think about whether this stronger therapeutic alliance as well as fluctuations or increases in the strength of the therapeutic alliance over time will be associated with changes in neural processing of social rewards on a, on a, 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 on a neural level. And so um, uh, one of the goals that we have moving forward is using this paradigm that we developed that is personalized and, and, and focused on um, 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 the specific therapist and patient um, uh, dyad um, and, and how uh, uh, we can demonstrate perhaps that uh, uh, or study whether there are associations between the strength of the therapeutic alliance as reported by the therapist and the patient 
and the newer processing of social rewards, as well as performance, behavioral performance on the social reward paradigm um, in, a, in, a, in this combined um, paradigm. And so right now we're testing that within a randomized controlled trial. We're using the social reward paradigm that we developed um, and we're uh, having patients and therapists fill out uh, alliance measures over time. I'm not gonna show the paradigm because it's really in progress and we need to just make sure that it works before uh, moving forward. But I'll be happy to talk about it with uh, those who are interested later on. Um, so in so summary, and I'm wrapping up. Um, so the next steps is continuing uh, this thinking about matching patients, interventions, and mechanisms, um, and focusing on interpersonal and social aspects of psychotherapy as potential targets, um, examining neurobiological mechanisms and their association between neural activation and behavior over the course of treatment, developing objective paradigms uh, to study mechanisms. And I, and I wanna kind of highlight that I've been able to do this through the collaboration with neuroscientists and, 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 and um, uh, neuropsychologists and um, um, professionals from other disciplines that really help to think about these ideas from uh, other perspectives. Um, and focus on within per person uh, fluctuations over time, specifically in the association between mechanisms of outcome and ultimately uh, study whether specific patients, perhaps patients with a specific neural profile or patients with a specific behavioral or clinical presentation can, tar can benefit from targeting specific mechanisms within treatment packages um, or outside of treatment packages for that matter for in, in integrated eclectic therapists, so uh, uh, therapies. So our focus is on the mechanism. Um, and and, and, a, and a continuing this focus on non-responders, not only early detection, but also um, detecting predictors of non-response that can be then targeted in these uh, um, models that we're working on. So that's what I have for today. Um, I am looking forward to your questions. I wanna take a minute to thank a lot of people uh, in my path that uh, have made um, it possible to, to, to develop this, um, um, this um, research life. Um, and um, people at Adelphi, um, uh, this is the group that I've worked with uh, um, throughout my time at Adelphi, not only at Adelphi, now they're spread it out around the world. Harold is in Hong Kong, um, Ricky is in Germany, Sigal is back to Israel, unfortunately, um, um, Frederick is um, in Sweden, um, and uh, of course, uh, the group at Wild Cornell, uh, my mentors, George Alexopoulos, Joanne Syri, uh, Faith Gunning, um, and uh, other collaborators, Connor Liston, uh, Patricia Ari, and Pat Rowey, uh, and, and a great uh, team of junior faculty and postdocs that are um, collaborating with. And lastly, at uh, the Society of Psychotherapy Research, and um, I've put only some of the individuals that uh, ha have been really meaningful to me and my trajectory. And, it's not only writing um, with uh, some of those people and publishing with them and working on joint projects, but it's also people that I consulted with when I was looking for an internship and for a postdoc and who always willingly uh, picked up the phone and spoke to me and helped me and uh, encouraged me to become more involved in the organization and join committees and, 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 and uh, um, say what I thought uh, and, and, and express my opinion. And so this is one of the this is the reasons why I, I, I feel like the SBR and the Society of Psychotherapy Research is really became an academic home to me and somewhere where I can really feel like I, I belong and I can present my ideas regardless of where I am uh, institution wise and, and get feedback and get help and, and, and move my, my work forward on a personal and a, and a professional level. And then lastly, I wanna thank Alex uh, Vaz and the uh, ComCom committee for inviting me. This is really just, I'm very thankful for the opportunity. I think this is, I found this cartoon online. I think this is how Alex looks at the end of these uh, webinars, hopefully not. Um, but um, um, if you're interested in more of what we're working on, I'll be happy to talk more. Uh, this is my email address and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neely. And I think I speak for everyone. This is a really cool presentation. So thank you so much. And by the way, for everyone hearing us, uh, you did mention something in the beginning that I do want to highlight, which is this is especially cool and rewarding uh, presentation for us to be hosting because it's the first one that we're doing with an earlier career professional and researcher. And we hope to do more of these in the future. And we really started off in a wonderful way. So thank you so much again for this, Neely. Thank you. And now, as you were saying, we're going to move into some questions and discussion. So to all the attendees, 
you can either uh, raise your hand in the little raised hand icon you have on your dashboard, and I'll pass the mic to you, or you can write me a question on the questions tab, and I'll read it out loud to Neely so she can answer you. So let's just give it a minute and have some discussion on this presentation. Oh, as we are waiting for um, audience participation, I'd just like to mention that this webinar, as all the others, has been recorded. Um, on account of a request by Neely, it will be up on um, the Vimeo page of SPR, a little, I, I would say, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Neely, you said it in about a couple of months, maybe? Um, yep. Okay, so by the time then, we'll post it on the SPR uh, page uh, so that any, anyone can go there and, and check it out again. Um, so I have a question here. Uh, let me just open this up. So actually, you just have from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher this name, Dror Zajde, I'm so sorry, Dror, uh, who is uh, just saying that this was a great webinar. Thank you, Neely. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for participating. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has any comments or reflections for Neely, oh, I'm having a question here. Yeah, I have a question here also from uh, who is asking, do you have any programs for collaboration with startups? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the simple answer is no. Um, and the longer answer is um, you can reach me via email and we can talk more. <laughs> okay. You also have another question here uh, by Tian Kue, and he or she writes, I'm sorry, I don't know which gender. Uh, I notice that emphasis is put on client behavior in treatment. How much are you mm -hmm. focusing on isolating relational variables, especially with your interest in alliance as a social reward? Also, Early non-responder may be reacting to therapist variables. So do you understand? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So so um uh I think um dyadic um constructs are extremely important. Um we um we do often tend to focus more on patient variables um and and don't give enough attention to, to therapists. So I completely agree with that. Um, with the study we have ongoing, we're collecting alliance data for both uh, patients and therapists, and so we'll be able to address some of those uh, issues, and, 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 and that's definitely the hope to think about not only what the patient is reporting, what the therapist is reporting, but also uh, the, the, the potential gap and discrepancy or convergence, the divergence between the perspectives and how that's associated with possible uh, neural indices. Um, that we're thinking about, um, that we're hypothesizing, hyp that we're predicting are going to be activated. So that's definitely a direction moving forward, and I completely agree with you that those are uh, are really important. Um, and for the um, early response uh, uh, trajectory uh, paper, um, you know, I, I've had some discussions at SBR in our last meeting in Buenos Aires about how to incorporate therapist variables uh, within these models. So there's th that's definitely um, um, in the works. Um, uh, Jamie Delegato has been doing really fantastic work on thinking about how to in incorporate therapist variables in these models. And uh, we had a conversation that um, I'm hoping is going to guide some of those questions. But um, um, we, we currently um, uh, I, do, I, I think are not incorporating enough of that for sure, uh, and it's definitely something we should be putting more attention to. So you have five more questions here, and the first one comes here from Jackie in the UK, I believe, and she says, Hi, Neely. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. I was wondering how you would distinguish process factors from me mechanisms of change. In my mind, they, are, they can be separate, uh, and their way of researching and the way they impact treatment can be different. Um, yeah, I think 
using of terms and conceptualization is always uh, a huge issue. Um, we think of mechanisms as um, this putative construct that facilitates change in the treatment. So it's sort of this um, um, aspect of treatment that is either within the patient or within the therapy that makes the therapy work. Um, if you ask neuroscientists, I think they would say that that's a, a network in the brain that's being, uh, that's lightened up as a result of psychotherapy. Um, I think of process variables as sort of an umbrella and within those process variables, there might be some variables that could be considered mechanisms. Um, but um, I, there, I think there, the, the mechanism literature is so broad and many people define it in different ways. So I think it's also really depends on your perspective and the data that you have to show that um, a, a specific variables is, is um, 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 uh, um, sort of leading a quote unquote because we don't really have causality because all of our studies are uh, retrospective at this point uh, to um, symptomatic change. Thank you. I'm going to read now from a Wendy and she asks, do you have any ideas about how to approach non-responders amongst older people with depression? Sorry if I missed this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have, uh, so based on the, the study that we conducted, we think that um, targeting that um, low subjective social support is going to be beneficial. So we're thinking about how can we develop a frame to uh, facilitate uh, uh, change in um, social support uh, for these individuals uh, by uh, providing skills and and, 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 and and treatment components that can help them better understand um, how they can improve their interpersonal functioning and how can they engage with others. Um, and the other variables that I want to highlight that came up uh, in our models was treatment expectancy. So patients who expected to treatment to work were less likely to be early non-responders. And so I think that's really important to gauge. We didn't have treatment differences. Um, I think uh, we were a little bit hoping to have treatment differences because that may have guided this sort of more personalized um, a model where we would say, okay, these predictors predicted non-response in one treatment, but not on the other. Uh, but in our case, we didn't find a difference. And so we think um, this idea of whether a patient is, is, is uh, 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 perceiving that therapy is gonna be useful uh, is going to be very important early on. So I, I would put sort of my my stock in quote unquote on um, these two aspects: the social interpersonal aspect and the and the treatment expectancy aspect. And and and, I, and also because they're changeable, right? Uh, we can target them by doing things uh, um, on a dyadic level uh, from a working alliance perspective, for example, and also from a from a from a from a more practical perspective by developing tr clinical interventions that are gonna address uh, those variables. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm gonna move on here to the next question by Andrew McAlevey and he asks, very excellent presentation. Thank you, Neely. What patients are most likely to need additional social reward focus during treatment? Those with strong existing social support or those without, or is it not on that spe spectrum? Thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, Andrew is uh, uh, in at Cornell and is a very important person and collaborator. Um, uh, and I appreciate the question. I think that now we're thinking about a deficit model, so that's where we're at right now. So we're thinking about um, uh, those, based on our data, patients. So we had these two studies, right? One showed that when patients engage more in solitary activities, they essentially didn't move, they didn't respond to treatment. Uh, and then we have this other finding that's showing that when patients uh, had this uh, uh, reported these uh, are low social abilities or capacity to engage with others as well as low social support, they uh, were more likely to be early non-responders. And so um, the framework that we're, we have now is that uh, patients who are in need, so they have, you know, like um, mechanistically speaking deficits on this mechanism may benefit more from um, uh, this augmentation of social aspect. Mm -hmm. Another question here from Daniel Mogia, and he asks, thank you for your presentation. I liked it very much. I work also with patterns of change, response, trajectories, and predictors. What do you think? Are there late responders in the psychotherapy world? Do they exist? 
I'm asking this question because all the literature talks about early response or non-early response, but not if there are groups of patients who respond later during therapy. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good question. Um, I I don't have all of the data available in mind to answer the question, so I'm going to answer it on a non-database level. Um, I, the database answer is that based on our studies, uh, if you don't respond early on, you don't respond later on. But that's you know that that's not to say that that's true for all clinical cases. Of course, I think clinically or anecdotally speaking, you do see patients that sort of come around or take longer to respond. But I think on a uh, on a broader level across studies, um, there's this initial uh, steep slope uh, uh, that you see uh, when, you, when you look at multiple studies and more, multiple treatments that shows that if you respond early on, you're much more likely to respond later on. But I, you know, I haven't seen, and I, you know, I, I, again, I don't have all the information, so I may have missed something a study that focuses specifically on patients who don't respond later on and, and, and do respond, um, who don't respond early and do respond late. I would say that we have an ongoing study that looks at uh, multiple classes. And, and even in these classes, we don't have that sort of class that shows um, no response and then suddenly a response comes up. Um, but I think but the, but there, there are classes of patients um, again, from a data perspective that shows these fluctuations, right? So they're, they have like this zigzag type of slope where they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, um, and they don't, they don't necessarily fit with this like either stable slope that doesn't change at all or this like um, uh, linear reduction over time. Mm -hmm. Julia Fitz asks, Hey, Millie, thanks for the great talk. Do you, did you look at personality disorders and whether this factor was important for the improvement through interpersonal experience? So that's the first question. Second question, could you tell us a bit more about the social reward paradigm between therapists and patients? Uh, so for the first question, um, it's a, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a design question. Um, we, most of my work that I presented here, specifically on the social reward research that is newer, is conducted within randomized controlled trials for depression, which means that we don't take, we take in patients who have a primary access one disorder of depression. And so if they have significant personality disorder, they, uh, they, and, and which is which is sort of primary to their presentation. If they have a borderline personality disorder or an antisocial personality disorder, sort of something that really comes out, uh, they don't get recruited into the study. And so, you know, I, I really think there is great work um, that's been conducted on personality disorders by other groups, um, uh, um, um, but um, we don't have that here. Uli Kramer's work comes to mind um, in that context, but many others as well. Um, we do. We did measure neuroticism, so I can. I do tell you that I, I can. I can tell you that neuroticism as, as a personality trait comes up as predictor of non-response. Um, and um, in the panic trial, we uh, we do have some studies by Jack Keefe and uh, one of the studies that I published recently that we looked at access to comorbidities uh, as they relate to outcomes. So you can shoot me an email and I'll send you those papers. Uh, we have some nice findings from, uh, from um, these studies, but again, it's comorbid personality disorders to a primary affective disorder, in that case, panic disorder. Um, in terms of the uh, paradigm, um, uh, we, took these social, the, these monetary reward paradigms that are being uh, used in these reward uh, neurobiological studies, both EEG and fMRI, and these paradigms are essentially based on um, uh, are a very simple reaction uh, response uh, 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 um, design where you are supposed to respond to a target and then you get feedback, if you responded quickly enough, you get uh, positive feedback, meaning monetary rewards. And if you respond too slow, you get uh, negative feedback, meaning you lose money. And then there's also neutral trials. So we took those paradigms and we uh, shifted them into a social uh, reward uh, framework, which has been done by others, but we're thinking about it from a psychotherapy perspective and incorporating not only uh, feedback from um, a person, from another individual, but specifically from the therapist. 
Um, so that's the direction that we're taking with that, and we're testing it, we're piloting it. So I'm hoping we can have some data to share um, later this year. Okay. Thank you so much, Nui. I think that's all the questions we have. So would you like to kind of stop us off with a last reflection or idea? Last reflection. Mm. Last final word. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Um, <laughs> well, I want to say that I, I think if I have my last re reflection is the pictures of all the people that I presented. And I, I really, uh, looking sort of at the future, I really think that the, the most important component of my work is, is really not the most sophisticated statistical models, or though that's important, or the, or the data, or the environment is really the people that um, I got to collaborate with. Um, so I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, this webinar is sort of one of many in a series, but for me is, is, a, is a door opening to uh, collaborate with more people and hear people's ideas and criticisms about my research um, and, and, and what they feel is more is needed more or or what they're doing that's similar or different and I think that's really how we how I, I feel I, I progress the most um, um, within this academic community mm -hmm. well nearly on behalf of the SPR communications committee and myself personally thank you so much for taking up the challenge it was a really wonderful presentation and I want to again say that this presentation was recorded, so it will be up online in a couple of months. But I also think that if you send an email to Neely, she might be nice enough to send you a copy earlier on. We'll see. And having said that, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> once it's up online, we will put it on the Vimeo page of SPR. And um, having said that, oh, sorry, we have one last uh, comment here. I'll just read this up. So Satoko Kimpari is saying thank you so much for the wonderful job. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone who participated. And uh, of course, uh, you will be notified, everyone, through the SPR listserv and the Facebook page of our next SPR webinar, which will probably be during September. And until then, again, thank you so much, Nili. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for hosting me. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>